Thank you, Program Director. Um, yes, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We thought it good to, to just have a three-minute presentation to set the scene on this topic of culture shift by role players in the ecosystem value chain of service delivery, as it is also uh, an academic area of study. So just to set the context as to you know, uh, where this all fits in. I was told uh, it should be flighted, and then I can change the... Um, oh, the Okay, let's just see whether I can get the right presentation on. It's the wrong presentation. Excellent, and uh, I should be able to uh, to then flick through the slides. So I need to work out the clicker. Uh, can you please uh, go on to the next slide? The clicker doesn't seem to be working. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a very short presentation. <laughs> okay, I'm going to test whether I can... Uh, so there we are. Excellent. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if we look at... If we isolate the, the, the metaphor of the ecosystem, um, it's been commonly used in uh, management theory and innovation studies to understand complex environmental uh, environments, uh, organizational environments. And to this effect, uh, we had a few scholars over the past decade, as with specific reference to the year Professor Stephen Osborne from the University of Edinburgh Business School from Scotland, his team there at the university and together with like-minded international colleagues who was instrumental in developing the public service logic framework to manage and for the delivery of public services. Now, this public sector logic framework explores how public services can add value to the lives of public service users and citizens or can sometimes then destroy value if it's not delivered well. Value creation in terms of this framework is all about creating capacity for the public service user. In the end, to allow the public service user to become independent of the public service, to be able to become a contributor to the system instead of only a pure consumer. This is at the heart of the theory. So, in addition, also at the heart of the framework of theory are both then the conceptualization of value in the context of public services and an understanding that such value creation takes place within public sector ecosystems. Now, these scholars concluded that the ecosystem approach moved our understanding from a transactional and linear approach of new public management. And we need to understand that new public management is what underpins our current financial management legislation, the PFMA and the, uh, the F MFMA, towards a relational model where public service value creation is shaped by the interplay between multiple dimensions. And we will look at the next slide when it comes to that interplay. 
So the theory of public sector, of public service logic is a service dominant approach in contrast to a product dominant approach that we currently see with regard to the NPM or new public management ideology of input, outputs and outcomes. So the public service ecosystem approach explores an interplay between four levels. Firstly, if we look at the left hand side there, that figure, there's the atmosphere, the macro level of society's beliefs and values, the norms and rules. And this influences all the other levels within the public service ecosystem. And if we talk about public service, we're not talking about central government, it's all public services being delivered. The, mic the MISO level, the organizational actors, networks, and their procedures and their norms and values. The micro level being the individual actors in the system, the users of, of, of services, the public sector employees, and other key stakeholders, and the subsoil uh, level, the sub micro level of the individual beliefs and professional beliefs and norms and standards of each individual actor in the system. So if we look at the interplay between these four levels, it is clear that a lot of it is focused on the human element. You can have the best legislation, policies, procedures, but if it is not implemented, if it's not enforced by the very people in the system, you, you are going to struggle to create value. So we need to understand that it's the cultures embraced by the people, their behavior in practices that becomes entrenched in the system that determines value creation or value destruction. A public service does not create value in its own right. It is how the citizens interact with the service or the organization that creates that value. To establish a school and to place a teacher is not going to create value. It's how the pupil interacts with those resources, the public sector organization resources, that will create the value. And the success of that value will depend on previous interactions that the people will have with an experience then from previous interactions that will depend on how successful that will be and of course then the personal and family values of that uh, pupil. So coming to the value destruction bit, it's equally possible that poor design or, serve of, or, or delivery of public services can make the lives of service users, service staff and or other citizens worse. And for our South African situation, and we heard, we heard the, the previous speakers uh, also, you know, touching on, on a lot of these aspects, um, we, may, we must realize that there may be embedded cultures in our public sector organizations that may not be conducive to service delivery. So hence, this culture shift by role players to create value in our public service delivery value chain, I think it's quite topical and uh, a good, I hope it leads then for, for, for a good panel discussion. Thank you very much. I have this, if you're interested in, uh, in public service logic, there's a whole reference list and if you wish me to share this with you or you can just contact uh, Vuyu and he can share this presentation with you. Thank you. I see I forgot to, to go through the last slides. There's the reference list. And there's the thank you. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Erasmus, on that uh, background around um, the ecosystem and the value chain and the creation of value. I think what was interesting to me is that the inverse of that is that there could also be the value destruction as you, as you outlined. And I think following from the discussions that we've had with the previous uh, with the previous speakers, I'm much more inclined to say perhaps we might be sitting somewhere in between value add as well as the value destruction, but leaning more towards the value destruction. I think when you pick up uh, Dr. Dr. Madiba from the presentation that the Judge Mwepe indicated, he said at a point where we were supposed to win, uh, we kind of like failed and, 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 and progressed. Perhaps just give us your, your, your overview of where we are as a country on, on, on that aspect of, of value creation and destruction. Thanks. Uh, Problem Director, thank you for that. I think let me first greet uh, everyone in attendance today and all protocols observed. I was continuously saying to my colleague as um, a judge who was talking, they are stealing from our points that we discussed as a panel. <laughs> and even when the minister was talking, I said, ah, they are stealing from our points. And your follow-up comments, and I was like, ah, they continue stealing from our points. Now the audience is going to be bored because it's going to be like, we're sounding like broken records. But still we will find a way of being creative to not necessarily use the same terms because I'm not going to be able to have a reference list like Prof. I'll end up with some plagiarism that I will have to continuously say, please avoid plagiarism. But going to the point, I think it's important to first say, how did we lose what we thought we had? And also, is it completely lost or not? And if it's not completely lost, what is it that we need to do and what is the role of each? And if we take this back to the theme, of the theme of the conference, I would like to start off by saying, are we understanding ourselves as to where we are in the social ecosystem? Because the question is, who lost what, where, how? What role have you played in the loss that we are reflecting on? And that makes me to start by asking everyone in attendance to say, can we first define what we mean by society? Can we also define what we mean by a citizen? Because at the end of the day, even if we say professionalize the service, or professionals must make it a point that they play their role, who are those? Where do you find yourself in that ecosystem? So if we don't uh, go to that, remember my, my second uh, uh, mouth now is held here by a solo tape, so as I move, it's gonna keep on me. Um, uh, uh, so if I, I'm going back to the point is, how do we then find ourselves within that ecosystem and own up in terms of where do we find the role to be played and not only finding yourself. And I can actually link this to the characteristics that I think we probably need to all have, not only as society or maybe as citizens, but also as professionals. Because if what we are saying is lost, cannot be defined by all of us, we will not know what exactly that we need to correct. If I move away from that point and say, do we understand the common goal in a, in, a sim, in a similar way, just all of us? Because the question that um, the judge continuously asked, to me the answer is still within us to understand if our, uh, our goal is really common. And if our goal is really common, then we have no reason to lose that what we believe uh, we have actually lost. Because if we put values which I cannot dissociate from culture, 
and we put them on autopilot, then we will remain lost. Because if everyone is able to say, I appreciate the values that I have to live up to, you will have no reason to even have a, a, a jails that are overflowing. Because if we, we all, as a society, live up to those values. Now, taking from what Prof was saying, if we all say there's value creation to be created in the public sector, but must it be created only by the public sector in terms of the civil servants, or must it also be created by us as part of society? Because back home, you are the member of society. You are a professional and a civil servant in the office, but back home, you are part of that, what needs to be given the service. You are also giving the service to yourself. I'll make a very um, a simple <coughs> example here. Some years ago, uh, I'm not going to volunteer my age because uh, 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 you'll end up being able to test, I guess it. I'll just say some years ago, I used to be a CFO at City Power. And as part of executives of City of Johannesburg, we were putting together the concept which we called separation of refuse at source. And all of us at home, we've got refuse bins. And if we don't separate the refuse at home, it therefore means the city of Jobek must employ more resources to separate that. Yet if all of us as citizens, we can tell ourselves that the taxpayer's money that's invested in trying to perform that function would have been invested <coughs> elsewhere. But now, you mix a paper and a bottle and a, a, a box, you, you just take garden refuse, you take everything and you mix it together, builder's rubble and everything. But you can't generate energy from builder's rubble but you'll be able to generate energy from peels of some vegetables and so on. So that point of separation of, uh, at source would not have been achieved by city of Jobek alone, but by citizens telling themselves that we are part of the same service that is needing to be rendered. We are part of the same source of that taxpayer's money that we needing uh, to be actually saving. Where we lose it is putting our values on autopilot and separate ourselves from those that render the service, forgetting that those that render the service are part of the same society, and therefore, if you are part of the same society, be part of the solution. Don't blame civil servants in the office, yet after hours, you become part of the team that's blaming the, the, the same civil servants. Therefore, community participation in decision making in relation to supporting those initiatives that are put forward by the public service, I would say that's a key area for us not to lose it so that we don't always blame it to only the leaders, but we also lead ourselves for the leaders to be successful in leading us. Very profound <coughs> way of looking at it. So you define citizens, you find expression in the citizens that we as professionals find ourselves there. And it is actually us, in turn, giving service to ourselves. And to the extent that we don't do that with the full commitment that we have spoken about, we deprive no one but ourselves. Yeah, now well, that's a profound way of looking at it. Um, yes, sir. Uh, perhaps your reflections uh, on what the prof has already said and what Dr. Madiba has already said with regards to this. And in particular, especially now that, uh, that Dr. Madiba has made it quite difficult, <laughs> who, who should we be looking to to change or to shift this culture? given that we as professionals are also now part of that citizen role, part of us sub, sub providing service to ourselves and being part of leadership at the same time. All right. No, thank you, Program Director. I think that is a very uh, not so complex question and uh, straight to the point because when you look at the, the, the ecosystem itself and uh, all the role pillar players involved there. We have our own communities, 
uh, were in those communities there. Uh, if you look at local government, if I can be more specific in looking at local government, which is the driver of service delivery through provision of our infrastructures. And when you look at it, uh, same community is also responsible for the destruction of those infrastructures. So we have to change a mindset of our communities or as a citizen in terms of looking of, uh, after our own infrastructure. And also remember for that infrastructure to be there, there are also role players in terms of your, your, those who've been appointed uh, through your local municipalities, your district or your, your departments. Uh, in a way that they are responsible for ensuring that they procure quality services uh, uh, for, 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 for the development of the infrastructure, as well as uh, making sure that uh, all these beautiful plans that we have in terms of your, uh, you look at your maintenance plans that our local authorities would have there, and ensuring that uh, we properly and on a timely basis make sure that our infrastructure is it's, it's well maintained. If you had listened to uh, Honorable Dr. Nkosa Zana, the minister, she spoke to 84% uh, of our water service uh, authority uh, municipalities having uh, distribution, major distribution losses. So that is also an indication that uh, in terms of your those appointed to serve the people, they have a role to play to, into ensuring that that infrastructure is also maintained. And then also let's look at the issue of uh, monitoring and, in, in, and evaluation. Where, who, who, who's, who, who's monitoring those in governance? Uh, I was glad that uh, also uh, Dr. Nkosazana mentioned uh, an issue of having an independent uh, MPEC that will review reports and also report to, to the council. I think uh, as much as we will keep on pointing fingers to certain group of individuals, uh, we will not go anywhere. So we need to find a common goal to say all of us will have a role to play uh, as a citizen, as a professional, I have a duty as a professional into ensuring that I uphold those ethics that will uh, ensure that there is accountability. Thanks, thanks. Great stuff. Um, and at the Malema, I think you are also raising a very important part where you say, uh, and you included them as part of professionals, the service providers. And I think, Prof, I would want to latch on to your thoughts around, we have reflected, and I think Dr. Madiba has, has reflected on who the citizens are, and she took it quite close to us and individualized it and personalized it. I want to just take it as well and, and ask, what is the role of, of corporate citizens, and how should corporate citizens find expression in also being part of uh, culture shifting. Because I do understand that <clears throat> government, when it does business, it also doesn't do business government to government. It's government doing business with, um, uh, with, the, private, with the private sector. What role do they have to play in, in the culture shift? Are they exonerated from shifting the culture for the purposes of value, or are they not? And how can we bring them in? Um, Stephen, yes. Uh, you know, if you talk about value creation in service delivery, it's about the interaction between the citizen, whether corporate or individual, and the resources being placed there by government, the public sector organization, and its people. And certainly, you know, I think uh, we have a social responsibility as individuals, but also from the corporate sector to assist government 
in their endeavour to create a better life for everybody in this country. So when it comes back to the, the theory of what I've presented, uh, public service logic, one of the key elements of that is that there should be co-contribution, co-operation. And so from that perspective, corporate should come on board with regard to service delivery projects um, and as a social contribution. And that is also being expected these days more and more, you know, in your, your integrated reporting on how you as a, your, your social awareness, it's all coming into your, your, your corporate um, psyche, if I can call it like that, um, that, they, that, that they have an obligation to also, um, you know, assist in uplifting and capacitating the people of the country to be able to move forward and become independent of public services to provide for themselves. Um, I think that would be, in short, my answer to the, uh, the, the, the corporate citizen um, question. Although um, I would rather speak to, to what I feel is the, the role of the public sector employee in this um, interaction between role players, uh, which I feel, if we talk about governance failures, where I feel that there's a lot that can be done to improve on that part. But uh, if that's a follow-up question, I'll wait for it. No, you can, you can go for it. No, you can go for it, uh, Prof. <laughs> right, so... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, you know, if, if we look at the, the literature uh, of, uh, you know, the, the, the scene that was set, um, it boils down to, in any public sector ecosystem, that the interplay between stakeholders is about their norms and values within that ecosystem to either create that public, public service uh, a, a value or to destroy that value. So when it comes to governance failures uh, in the ecosystem, my thoughts immediately went, uh, because I feel strongly about this, it's something that I've seen over many years, the human resource management or people management within our public service organizations. Um, you know, so if I, I purely focus then my attention around public sector employees and the, their employment practices. Uh, I think there's also a general realization that there's a need to professionalize the public sector. And this is where it's coming from. The question, however, is what does it mean to professionalize the public sector? What do we need to do? And perhaps we need to ask ourselves, but why are we calling for this? What is happening at the moment? What cultures are entrenched? What cultures are embraced that we need to want to see change? So, going probably to the most uh, talked about issue in recent days or weeks or months would be the Carter deployment. And in essence, employing senior managers that are sensitive and supportive to the ruling political party policies, it's a global practice. It's just it's, it's, it happens all over the world. The problem is then when the practice is not based on merit and professional career public service as or servants, but on nepotism and patronage, creating the impression that politics is the most reliable way to access jobs and business opportunities. And we know from media reports and other anecdotal evidence that municipalities in particular are prone to the capture by factions, whether it's political or otherwise. Uh, our, our president even made mention to that uh, in the last week. 
So unfortunately, we have a deeply entrenched culture over the past couple of decades where, um, you know, it's, it's where we experience sabotage of competitions within uh, at municipalities and awards being linked to municipal systems of jobs and tenders with very little regard to service delivery. So if people's focus are elsewhere, then the services are just not getting delivered. I can also say that my personal experience over the past 20 years of being a lecturer and in lecturing public sector financial um, governance, over the years, I saw many students that embarked on disruptive student politics to be able to get to climb the political ladder and through that achieve their career success in the public sector instead of doing that through their newfound education. And these are cultures that we are talking about. It is acceptable communities, norms and values, societal values that are being embraced or condoned on how things are working. And these are the things that we need to change. So, having said that, there's four issues that I basically thought about. Firstly, a mechanism to vet the appointment of executive management, and I know that it's been on the cards for, through the Zondo Commission. But importantly, apolitical public sector employees, they know external work or business interests allowed for public sector employees. More than 20 years ago, I worked for the public sector, and the rule was you are in the employ of the public sector 24 hours a day. It's still so, it's just not being enforced. And then trustworthy personnel performance evaluation systems. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about a public servant, whether for a municipality or a government department, that does their job, that does what they're supposed to do. And that will already solve issues of maintenance. You know, why are people not implementing or you know, executing the maintenance budget, just doing their job. So if we focus on the appointment of, or, or, or on executive appointments, it would make sense because uh, that's the tone at the top, setting the right tone at the top. So the Zonda Commission, we know, proposed that an independent statutory body be established to assess prospective candidates uh, at state owned entities in terms of their qualifications and integrity. I would argue that it would be a good idea to consider similar appointment bodies or mechanisms across all spheres of the public sector to ensure that we get career-driven servants appointed. There will be another question to say, but you know, how do you keep these bodies independent or uh, you know, free of external influence? The second point I mentioned was um, you know, the politicization of service delivery. And this teaches people that politics is the key that provides access to government services. Instead of a situation where all South African citizens that function under and support a democratic dispensation have equal access to government services and emergency assistance. So there's a selective um, delivery of services. And, and that comes through the risk if there's no proper leadership to set the tone. The risk always prevails that middle and lower level civil servants, and, and we saw this, and, and I might even say this, that we saw this in the, in, in the apartheid era, that policies that were never meant to have the effect that it did was actually the cause of the lower and middle level uh, public sector um, civil servants or, and in society. Uh, on how their personal beliefs and, uh, you know, on a micro-social level also led to them uh, executing the mandates of government the way they see fit. And for that you need your 
tone at the top, your political, uh, or you have to tone at the top your, your proper senior management being appointed, but also you need to depoliticize the public sector as a whole. Um, I wrote here that a politicized public sector confers on unprofessional officials the power to be selective in rendering their services, withholding equal access to services and opportunities, and be selective in holding colleagues accountable. That's what politics does. So, a professional career public servant, as far as I'm concerned, to the lowest level should be apolitical. So what does apolitical mean? It just means that politics should not influence how you deal with your work situation. You can still go and vote for the political party of your choice in a general election, but it should not determine your actions at work, not in a democratic dispensation. Coming to probably what is the closest to my heart, because I think this is a real problem at the moment, is outside work or business interests interest for public sector employees. And we actually have policies and legislation against it, this, but it's not being enforced. Now, I'm probably talking about anecdotal evidence now, but we all talk to one another and, and we're, we're aware of the situation. And I'm uh, not even referring to, to, to government employees that's doing business with the state that has received a lot of attention. I'm simply referring to permanently employed public sector workers with business interests outside of their main employment. Whether it's a taxi, whether it's a spider shop, doesn't matter. Because the fact remains is that this leads, in my opinion, it leads to poor, poor work ethic, poor discipline, inefficiency, ineffectiveness, irregular use of state resources, and is the root of tender corruption. This practice of having other business interests and outside remunerated work while being permanently employed in, 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 in public sector. On the 7th of August, the Cape Times reported that National Treasury have found 2,000 municipal employees trading with the state in the past three years. Yet, there's laws against this. On the 3rd of September, just now, 10 days ago, News 24 reported that the DPSA revealed nearly 300 public servants moonlighting as municipal councillors. And there's, it's in direct contravention of the Public Service Act. So why are we not enforcing this legislation? You need permission from the executive authority to earn outside remuneration. Otherwise, that you need to forfeit that remuneration to the, you know, to the fiscus. I had a recent personal experience of a postgrad student that asked these questions to people in the procurement division of, of the public sector and its senior managers, and they said, you will not get a good candidate in a public sector uh, post in procurement if you don't allow them to consult outside. Now, you know, so it's being defended, and there might be people in this room, because it's, it's a growing trend to get side hustles going, you know, to, to earn some extra money. But the answers to the question is clear for me. Firstly, why would people with high net worth occupy low-paying positions at a municipality or government department relative to their wealth? If not for the influence that they can exert or the access to resources or networks that may benefit their business interest. Secondly, where are these people's focus, their dedication, their diligence, if they have other business concerns to attend to while they are at the office? supposedly performing the work that they are permanently employed for. It's always nice to know that your salary is guaranteed and you can focus your effort on earning additional income, right? Or, or you know, spending your time for, for expanding your political influence. But the cumulative effect of all of this uh, on service delivery, if every second public sector employee comes to the office to use the phone, the computer, the stationery and office hours, to spend on running external business interests or side hustles will be poor service delivery. People are not getting the services that they want. They can be the best systems, legislation, processes. So where's the employee performance evaluation in all of this? 
Who is trying to get people to do their work that they're appointed for? Now, we have very good employee performance evaluation systems. But then, and again, I can say that, you know, I did some inquiries, and it's from our own experience as well. There's a tendency that employees expect to get top-notch evaluations, even though it's totally contrary to the evidence of their performance. And, but where does the supervisor then come in? Are they then feeling uh, intimidated by employees, by giving them good scores, or that perhaps they don't want to be unpopular? or they don't want to get, go against societal expectations, community expectations, that you don't give a negative reflection on your own people. The fact remains is that this leads, this ineffectiveness leads to uh, ineffective human resource management and entrenches poor work ethic. People just coming and going and doing what they want, no discipline at all in the offices, and if you've ever been in a government department or municipality, you'll know what I'm talking about. Thus, to professionalize, to, to, to conclude, to professionalize the public sector and ensure career-driven public servants are employed to create value in public service delivery, there's a need to have a mechanism to monitor the appointment of senior management to ensure that they have the right qualifications and integrity to depoliticize all levels of public sector employees, and not just now this new uh, you know, bill act that's coming through that, that um, says that senior managers of municipalities should not, be, um, should not hold political office, but it should, should be through all levels. Um, policies and legislation on remunerated outside work and external business interests should be enforced. It should be enforced. People should focus on their job. And we need to revisit the effectiveness of the employee performance evaluation system so that there can be discipline, so that there can be consequence management for poor work performance. Unfortunately, untimely, uh, we need public sector employees that focus, oh, sorry, ultimately we need public sector employees then that focus on service delivery and nothing else. And that's from me. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Prof. I think it's a mouthful. Uh, let's professionalize. Let's have career focused. Let's uh, hold uh, those that are employed within the public service accountable. Um, uh, Dr. Madiba, as Prof was outlining the solutions, uh, I couldn't help it but keep this question kept reverberating in the back of my mind that uh, the judge indicated that professionals as we are, we were there uh, when what ultimately ended up as state capture was pronounced or finding ourselves where we are. And I think you mentioned in your, in your, in your, in your presentation already that there are some values that we lost along the way that we need back. Uh, give us solutions to this problem uh, from your side. Is, is professionalizing enough uh, on its own? Uh, thank you, Program Director. Before I respond to that question, I would like to first look at our president here. I don't see him, but I will go to him in absentia. I see his seat, but I don't see him. <laughs> he, he made a mention as part of his opening remarks uh, of professionalism in the public sector. And I wrote that note down because uh, amongst ourselves as a panel, we also discussed the same. But um, as he was talking, he took it closer to even mentioning some framework and I was asking myself, how many standards, frameworks, whatever you want to call it, policies and so on. I mean, as a country, globally, we are known as a leading country when it comes to policies. They are nicely written. We can come up with standards. You can go to the principles by King. You can go to uh, a code of professional conduct. You go to SICA, to EBA. You go to Association of Internal Lawyers. You can go anywhere you're going to find that We've got nicely written documents. The question is, 
how do we find that point of convergence between what is written in that book and what we actually practice? And how do we align our own conduct as individuals to that? Because it's one thing to have a Bible and you go to church to preach because you want to get the collections from church as a pastor, but it's not your calling. And even if it wasn't your calling, but because you are in that environment, why can't you try and look into characteristics in you that would align you to what you need to be doing? Because we all live by the choices we make for ourselves. You made that choice to be there. Align yourself with where you are. If you are an auditor and you know that, this is the first line of defense. Even if somebody had said, maybe you may study auditing and you never thought it was your calling. Now that you made that choice, you are there, then try and find what can you do as an individual. I'm going back to the point that uh, our president was raising about professionalism. Because I was saying to myself, if we have those frameworks and standards and whatever you can name, but do we have capacity in terms of enforcing? And again, if we were to live up to our own values, do we even need somebody to enforce? So let's not put values on autopilot. If you can take that as a theme, don't put values on autopilot because if we don't put values on autopilot, the solution is that each and everyone will do what is right because you will not want to associate yourself with something that is against the values that you have actually set there. Even the enforcement does not need capacity if we live up to our values. I'm gonna make another example that is completely outside um, the, the field we are talking about, just outside local government and auditing profession. If there is no market to buy a stolen cell phone or stolen laptop, would the thief go still? Who are you gonna sell that to? If the society has values not to accept stolen goods, therefore that thief will have no market and will change that culture of stealing because there's no market. But the problem is that by the time the thief goes to steal, he already knows that um, at number so and so, that's right, they need a, a Nokia, uh, that they need an iPhone. So you are still knowing that you have a market already. So if all of us were to stop putting values on autopilot, whoever is doing something that is wrong will have no market to actually sell that. If I'm in a supply chain management of a municipality and there's no service provider to collude with, Will I be involved in any corrupt activities? Because who, who's going to be doing this with me? It's definitely because somebody out there is party to this that encourages that you love your values. Now, in society, is this business person not the member of the same society that we are servicing? The same society that needs to help us to put people first. Who's gonna be putting people first and who are you putting first as people? You are part of the same, but the moment you put values on autopilot, you're not gonna be able to achieve this because someone else must come and enforce something which would not even need resources to be uh, enforced if all of us were just to follow our values. I wanna link the same comment, a program director, if you allow me. Uh, to the point that Prof was raising about performance management. Performance management system is there as just a, as a white elephant. Because whether organizations, uh, whether the municipalities perform, but bonuses will still be paid. Where is the conscience when you are doing that? You are actually condoning the fact that people must lose that value to say, I'm earning a salary for work performed, for the service rendered. I always remind people wherever I go, and I think they become fed up with me in these audit committees I chair and boards, They'll, because I'll be saying, if we can all define what a salary is, it's compensation for a service rendered. If you have not rendered a service, why do you accept that compensation? Because at month end, when it goes into your bank account, if you are really living up to your values, 
You should be conscious that, hey, by, by the way, I'm not entitled to this. I don't know if you will take it back or you will improve in performing because maybe it's not possible to take it back because you've got commitments, whether you bought a car or a house, bought keys to pay for and everything. So let me be realistic to say you won't take it back. But can it at least trigger something in your values to say, man at month end, there's this in contact that comes to my phone. Did I render that service or not? Again, take away the point of putting values on autopilot because when you sit at home, you must know that there is something that comes to me because there's an expectation that I will have rendered the service. And I'm gonna again quote uh, my um, uh, president of SAIGA. There's a point as well that uh, he had uh, raised where he said, um, I just wanna go to that point. He said, in terms of the auditing and accounting profession, we have removed ourselves from the society. And he made reference to the reports that are complex. And I said, yes, I see that as a problem, but I think I wanna add more to say, are we able to define what we really mean by auditor independence in relation to you being the member of the same society where you are observing wrongdoing happening. But now you believe that there'll be a conflict of interest because I'm senior manager in this audit and I'm coming from that village. I know that there was supposed to be a bridge built. That bridge was not built. I'm auditing this municipality. This bridge worth 35 million is actually appearing here as having been constructed. There's a service provider that has actually done this. The payment has been made. But you come from that same village. You are an auditor. You're not raising it just because you feel you need to be independent of the audit. But now, should we blame the auditor or should we say we need some reforms even in terms of redefining auditor independence in relation to finding that point of convergence between the auditor as an auditor in the profession and you being a member of society? Because now you will not turn a blind eye against what you know is wrongdoing just because you are auditing me as a municipality, so you can't raise it because you have to be independent of what you are doing. Now, how do we then go beyond only what we have there in terms of independence as it relates to me and other interests within the client? Should we also go beyond to say, let's link this to the society because as the president was talking to say we remove ourselves from the society, and he was referring to the report, I then said, but what do we do within the society now, beyond the matter of reporting, to say, let me also be a police of the taxpayer's money that is also coming from me in relation to that what I know, so that when I audit there, I'm able to raise this, even if it means when you look at whatever code you may uh, be talking to, say, maybe can I have someone else within the team dealing with this one? I happen to be coming from that village, and I think there might be something wrong in this area, but you are not wanting to be seen to be saying there's something wrong without having tested so that you can bring evidence that there's something wrong. But declare that conflict, but now you've got nothing that guides you as to how you're gonna declare it. Go to the municipality. At the municipality itself, you have got council members, as um, uh, there's a, a comment already made by Prof. But these council members that are also uh, uh, employees of the public sector are also in business. And certain people will be respecting their authority in terms of keeping quiet and they know what is happening. Because our whistle lower protection is just an act, but not necessarily being executed. You tell me how many people had been killed because they were investigators. Is the law not there to protect them? It is there, but is it really protecting them? No. Now, will we have guards as we sit here to actually whistle blow when we know that ah, we're gonna be killed, we're gonna lose our lives, then our families are gonna be lost and everything it goes back to the point of execution again. There's a point that my colleague mentioned, Jerry, saying uh, monitoring and evaluation. Again, 
what can we do in terms of not just monitoring and, and evaluating by ticking a box? Because if you just tick a box, you're gonna go to these KPIs that I always reject on, on whatever board I sit when they give an APB that says uh, uh, submission of four reports per annum. And I'm saying submission of a report, I can take a piece of paper and I will write a date and I will put a title and I'll indicate it relates to KPI 1.2 in terms of this strategic objective and then I sign and I submit the report. What did I say in that report? I've just indicated what it relates to. Now, if then as an auditor I come in, I find a KPI like that in a municipality that will be saying you submitted a report rather than the actual execution. It therefore means as an auditor as well, you are not closer to the society because you should tell yourself that, you know what, a, a submission of a report, so what? The impact on the society is not a report. Is that what is supposed to have been done? So therefore as an auditor, take that thing, chuck it away to say, no, 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 this one, there can't be money spent on writing a report, your salary, your end for writing that report. So you don't need an additional budget to actually write that report. Now to come to your point, let's move away from accepting things that we know they're not supposed to be accepted. Even as auditors, tell yourself that yes, it's what is there, but they'll improve it in the next year. Put it there as something that needs to be actually attended to. And share, uh, program director, lastly, I just want to make a, a, another point which uh, I, I think uh, is covered by the three speakers uh, in the morning to say, and especially the president, government needs to involve the community in the governance of the public sector. And as a panel, we spoke to this yesterday and we said, you know what, there's a problem here in the sense that we, we as a community, we think that uh, we must just sit and wait for the service to come our way. What is our role as a community? To raise our heads and hands in terms of that what is expected to be a service to us. Because if we don't, we are again letting things just go on autopilot. Let us take a responsibility to say if we know that if our IDP is realistic with municipalities. During public consultations, we were promised that there will be a bridge here, which is connecting the two villages. Now, when the following year comes, there are again IDP uh, uh, participations. And uh, the same bridge is getting into the IDP. As a member of that society, why are you not standing up to say, no, no, but last year this bridge was there. What happened last year? Was it not included there? You go attend council meetings. You hear their budgets being approved. You know this bridge was there. It had a budget. Even if you can't read the annual report and therefore you won't see if it was really there. But stand up and ask, but what happened to the money that was put aside for this same bridge? But within the same society, auditing profession is also coming from the same point. So therefore, if all of us are working together, towards that common goal that I indicated, that's where actually the point was lost. And I would like program director to say, before we leave here, allow me to give you an input for the deadline of 31st December, because I do already have one, but I will keep it uh, to the end so that I can give it as, as my input. But realistically, I, I, I need to just say, all of us, let's accept that we have a duty as a citizen towards ensuring that there is clean administration. The enabling environment must be created by all of us. And the moment you create that enabling environment, all of us will be able to be the solution so that governance is not only governance at the level of the leadership but all of us become members of governance structures by governing that what we know we're entitled to. Because in corporate governance, we are related to boards. And uh, my research is always more around corporate governance, uh, even though the last one was more on the line of digital transformation. But realistically, if you go to the principles and principles of corporate governance, whether it's private sector, it's an entity, it's a government department, governance is governance. And if all of us can be able to ensure that we are part of that governance, 
self-govern, then be part of governing the others, the others, then you will live up to those values and kill the market for all the wrongdoing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Madiba. I think you have, um, you have wrapped it up for us. I think you have indeed indicated that let us not put, uh, 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 let's not put this on autopilot. We need to be there to ensure that the values are there. I think we are out of time. Uh, I'm going to give Ndate uh, Chikunda <clears throat> Malema a minute just to wrap it up for us uh, and take us home on this, on this point. I will equally challenge uh, Saiga. Uh, you're actually not challenged by me. You are challenged by Dr. Madiba in saying she wants to give input in the 31 uh, December deadline. But I think you must take it further because I think from the discussions you could hear the richness of the inputs that are coming on the ecosystem and the value at chain. I think I would challenge you to have some form of, uh, of inputs from the panel members on any of the publications that you will be publishing in so far as ecosystem and value chain is concerned. And that is Thank you for talking about that. I think as, as we conclude, uh, what one would say is that we all have a role to play uh, in, in our societies and in our working environment, and we need to play that role with honesty and integrity. And also when you look at our public sector, I think we also need to create an enabling environment for our professionals. I believe South Africa has professionals, whether it's engineering, it's accounting, it's law, they've got enough professionals that that, that can actually service the, uh, the public sector. But what we need to take care of or to ensure, let's create an environment in the public sector wherein the professionals will be attracted and uh, they can actually go and service the public sector. If we could do that, uh, I think things will change uh, from, 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 from my viewpoint. Thank you. Great stuff, wrapped up quite well. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Resmas, uh, Dr. Madiba, and Dr. Chukunda Malema for those inputs. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will um, release them. I think the next item that we will have is there will be a flight of, of, uh, of, of an advert. And uh, thereafter, we will take uh, a presentation uh, from Prof. Leon van Furen. Uh, that will talk to who's the executive director of professional and business ethics and will then talk about the demand for ethics against the deteriorating morality. I think again you will see the thread that continues to be linked between the discussions that are happening. Uh, Dr. Madi Madiba indicated that we can't put values on autopilot. There needs to be some form of ethics that is embedded and that we take as citizens throughout. So thank you very much. And as I release you, we play the adverts, and thereafter, Prof. Van Furen will take us through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.